come fired up tonight here. Can you guys hear me in the back over there? Hey, Amen. Well, I'm fired up to preach the word of God here tonight. You know, in Psalm 126 and verse 1, the Bible says, Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we are filled with joy. This is an amazing passage that is a passage that is emblematic of our movement. And I believe the City of Angels Campus Ministry can echo this passage that God has done great things for us. I mean, blowing out our special missions by $42,000. I, I, I just got to lift up Jason and Sarah Demetrius. You know, 1 Chronicles 12 says that God gathered people around David so he could have an army like an army of God. And to see how God is gathering here in Los Angeles, this is truly something special. Uh, to now have the Pavones with us in the South region. And by God's divine providence, having the parishes with us in the West. And then the capstone for Operation Jerusalem, having the Gregories with us as well. God has done great things. I mean, even the kingdom appointments. To see Stephen and Edie get appointed for the Lord. And already been sent out to see the Alexanders get appointed for the Lord. I mean, the mission teams, two to seven mission teams now, from Thailand and DFW, Lincoln, Maui, Kona, Denver. God has done great things. But what it's all about, it's all about saving souls. And to see over 200 baptisms, 45 restorations, going from 793 to 960, we're on our way to 1,000 for the Lord. And God did all of that. You know, I'm excited for the basketball tournament tomorrow. And as Jason said, God is sovereign. And whoever God wants to win, God's going to allow them to wish. <laughs> but it's going to be a fun time for the Lord. But in, in, in every, mo most sports, there's something called halftime. And during halftime, you have a coach that always gives an inspiring speech to the team. If they're down, we see what we can do better. If they're up, we continue to do what we're doing, but go even higher. And it's interesting, I was thinking about it, what do we talk about after God has done all those great things? It is indeed week 26 out of 52. It's halftime of the year. So I was thinking about it, what does Coach Jesus what does our Lord and Savior want to say to the L.A. campus ministry? I couldn't think about only one passage, John 14. You know, we, 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 we don't have a mic tonight. 
I don't know who tried to sabotage him. But it don't matter though. We're going to give our hearts to God and we're going to do our best. John 14, verse 12, what does Coach Jesus have to say to us? Verse 12, it says, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. What a humble thing of God to say. The audience is indeed the apostles. The Bible says the apostles were unschooled, ordinary men. If you didn't know in the Greek, ordinary means idiotic. Or in other words, idiots. But the Bible here said what Jesus says to these idiots, God himself says that if you believe in me, you would do the works I have been doing, but you would do even greater things. And that's the title of the lesson here tonight, Even Greater Things. And what's so amazing about this passage, what Jesus says, even greater things. It can't be talking about miracles. Because John 21 verse 25 says, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose, that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Even greater things. It can't be the miracles of Christ. So it must be talking about an evangelistic effort. And he said, this will happen when I go up to heaven. So let's see. When Jesus ascends, what happens with the apostles? Let's go to Acts 2. I'm going to be drinking a lot of water tonight, so. <laughs> uh, I'm, very, I'm, I'm very excited that Tyler Sears is not playing in the basketball tournament. <laughs> if you don't know why, then just tell, come to me in the fellowship, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> so the scene here in Acts 2, it's the day of Pentecost. All nations under heaven are in attendance. Most commentators believe millions of people were there. And we know from the kingdom of God study, this is the ushering of God's kingdom. And God indeed gives Peter the keys to the kingdom. So then Peter sees all the signs, the fire, the power, the wind, and the speaking in other languages. And he says, I think it might be time for me to shine here. And he preaches a sermon all about Jesus Christ crucified. That it is indeed our fault. But let's see the conclusion of his sermon in verse 36. It says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children, and all who are for all, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were baptized that day. Even greater things. Here, millions are in attendance. Peter gets a chance to preach the first sermon on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And he tells them that you crucified Jesus. And they were cut to the heart. And they asked Peter, what do I got to do to reconcile? Peter didn't say, come to the altar. Oh. 
Pete, Pete, Peter didn't have a guitar and the little lights and say, repeat this prayer after me. Peter didn't say, bring the babies and let's baptize them. What Peter says, you got to repent. That Greek word repent is metanoia. It means a changing of your mind and then to accept the will of God. Then when you repent, and only then when you repent, it's time to be baptized. And it's simple. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that day, 3,000, 3,000 were baptized. At the end of Jesus' ministry, he had 120. In the first day of the apostles' ministry, they saw 3,000 get baptized. Even greater things. Very quickly, though, to challenge them with this passage. If you're a guest here this morning, or it's not morning, it's tonight. If you're a guest here tonight, I want to encourage you and inspire you to study the Bible. And make sure, because real faith says that you would do what Jesus did, but do even greater things. Is that your faith here tonight? Let's see how these Men and women behaved after they got baptized. Verse 42, the Bible says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs. It said those who got baptized devoted themselves. That word devoted can be seen as a Addicted. They were devoted to the apostles' teachings, to breaking the bread, to fellowship, and to prayer. And I believe we have so many people who've been baptized this year to see all the new faces, to all those who made a decision to reconcile themselves with Christ. All the great things that we have to look at that God did that. But He did that through your faith. You were the vessel of God. Wow. But now it's time to recalibrate at halftime. Now it's time to do even greater things. And I got a couple points for us here tonight so we can do even greater things. The first one is quite simple. I got a simple lesson for you here tonight. Over here it says they devoted themselves. My first point, even greater devotion. Let's turn to Jeremiah 30. Let's read verse 1. Even greater devotion. That's what the Bible says. This is the Lord, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Write in a book all the words I have spoken to you. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll bring my people Israel and Judah back from captivity and restore them to the land I gave their ancestors to possess, says the Lord. These are the words of the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. This is what the Lord says. Cries of fear are heard. Terror, not peace. Ask and see, can a man bear children? Interesting. Then why do I see every strong man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor? Every face turned deathly pale. How awful that day will be. No other will be like it. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob. Amen, Jacob, Bibi. But he'll be saved out of it. It's an interesting passage. You want to get scared straight, read Jeremiah and Isaiah. It'll scare you right straight. Let's get into the context of this passage. 
The, the, the year is indeed 588 BC. Wow. What happens in 1000 BC, the Israelites are at the height of their kingdom yeah. as David is the king. He has a son named Solomon who has a terrible lust problem. And the kingdom deteriorates at the end of his leadership. But then his son, grandson of David, Rehoboam, destroys it because of his harshness. And then there's years of strife after this civil war. What was a unified kingdom of God became scattered people. Northern kingdom called Israel, southern kingdom called Judah. And then what happens in 606 BC, Babylon comes and takes the people into captivity. But then in 586, there's a complete destruction of God's city, Jerusalem. And this is two years right before the impending destruction. And God is trying to get their attention. But what happened? How did a powerful movement become a desolate wasteland? Well, 2 Chronicles 36 in verse 16 says, but they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people, and there was no remedy. It's simple. What happened to God's people and why God had to discipline them? They lost their devotion to God and his messengers. You see, a lack of devotion will lead to total destruction. Now, what was God's solution for his people? Well, let's drop down in verse 21 of Jeremiah 30. Verse 21 says, their leader will be one of their own. Yes. The ruler will arise from among them. I will bring, them, I'll bring him near and he will come close to me. Wow. For who is he who will devote himself to be close to me, declares the Lord. Wow. So you will be my people and I will be your God. Wow. What was his solution? This is indeed a prophecy of Christ himself. Yeah. That the Messiah will come and bring a messianic kingdom. And Jesus was the perfect example of someone totally devoted. But then God says, who's going to be devoted like him? Who's going to be devoted to be with him and his kingdom? Because he knows a lack of devotion leads to total destruction. You see, I, I believe with Man, two, over 200 Baptists, we're working hard. Come on, bro. Uh, people are sharing the faith. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes we can be so focused on devoting ourselves to the work right. that we forget the heart work. <laughs> because heart work is hard work. God is asking who's going to devote himself to him. He's saying, I want a people of my own eager to do what's good, to go and work hard in their relationship with the God, to work hard in prayer, to work hard in their quiet time, to work hard so they can see God one day in heaven. Even greater devotion. I believe it's time for us to really consecrate ourselves once again. With all the hard work that we did, I mean, I'm not going to lie, I'm tired. But that's why we have halftime. At halftime, what happens? You get some water. What's the water supposed to be? The living water. The Bible. As we're in halftime right now, it's time for you to drink up. Because you need to get some hydration. Greater hydration. Devotion. What are two keys to our devotion? I 
think, I think it's quiet times and denying ourselves. Now, let's look at a passage that talks about all of this. Let's go to 2 Peter 1. You know, Peter was one of those, Peter was one of those apostles who did those greater things. But if you look at Peter's life, the guy was kind of a mess at times. Maybe some, some of us can relate. But now we're reading the last writings of now of a more seasoned Peter. And let's see what he says in 2 Peter 1. In verse 5, the Bible says, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. Goodness, knowledge, and knowledge, self control. Sounds like deny yourself. And to self control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to god godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess the, these qualities in increasing measure they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ but whoever does not have them is nearsighted they have no vision and blind forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins therefore my brothers and sisters make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never fall away. And you receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Make every effort, sounds like a lot like devotion. And Peter here says that you gotta add to your faith. And he talks about all these different qualities and this, what's so important over here, he says, to confirm your calling. All of us who've been baptized, you've been called. But one day God's going to come back and see who was chosen. For you to confirm your calling, you have to make every effort to devote yourself to God. What does he say? He says, first, faith to goodness. That, you know, when you become a disciple, you just become a be a better person. I mean, if you met me when I was not a Christian, I don't even want you to meet me when I wasn't a Christian. I was a terrible person. I mean, I, I didn't want I, even this idea of even speaking to this many people. When I was, when I was, a, when I was a Christian, I would freak out. Um, I was mean. I was angry. I did, didn't, didn't, like, didn't like people. But then you add some goodness. And I know I'm talking about my sin here, but I know some of y'all sin too. And we had to add some goodness to our faith. Then goodness, knowledge. You see, we can't have the first principles be our greatest knowledge of God. I, I, I think... One, there's a lot of young Christians who just got baptized. You got to get a vision to know the word of God. Hosea 6 verse 4 says, my people perish because of a lack of knowledge. Add knowledge. And then he says, self-control. Deny yourself. Isn't that something? As, as disciples, we got to learn self-control. What's the quickest way to kill your devotion? Just get into a lot of sin. If you sin and you lack self-control, it kills your devotion. But when you have self-control, you say, I'm not going to do that. I have too much control. I'm not going to masturbate. Instead, I'm going to annihilate. 
I'm, 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 I'm not, I'm not going to get discouraged. Like discouragement is a sin. It's, just, it's, self, it's a lack of self-control. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lack faith. I'm going to be faithful. Because when God says something, it's going to happen. And then, and then it goes on and on and on. And you can read it for your quiet time. But what, what I, what I think was so awesome about Peter here, he says at the end, mutual affection and then add love. We know in John 21, after Peter denies Jesus three times, Jesus restores him and asks him three times, do you love me? And I heard it typically preached that at the end, at the first two times he says, I phileo you, which is the same translation for brotherly love that we see over here. But he actually doesn't say that. All three times he says, I phileo you. And then Jesus says, one day you're going to die for me and you're going to learn true agape love. But finally, in Peter's old age, yeah. he says it's not just enough to be a filet. It's not just enough to love as a friend. Yeah. You then also got to have love, agape love, yeah. unconditional yeah. love. You see, Peter himself had even greater devotion to God. And I believe a challenge for us right now is to look at these qualities and ask yourself, how is it going in increasing? You know, it's awesome. Uh, In about a month, I'm about to celebrate my seven-year birthday. Amen. (laughs) July 31st, 2016, I got baptized at the GLC. And through those seven years, there have been many times where my devotion was tested. And just like Peter, there's times where I was down, and there's times where I got back up. And as a disciple, you learn getting back up is the best quality you can possibly have. (laughs) Now, it was great that um, last week, Regina and I, my incredible wife, She's amazing. We got a chance to go to Atlanta for a family reunion. And it was a a great time with the family. It was the first time we did it, and we also celebrated my grandfather turning 90 years old. And my grandmother turning 78. So I was like, I got to reach out to my, my grandfather. So I imitated our leader, Kip McKean, and I got him a large print Bible. And I, I gifted it to him, and right before we left, he started reading it. And I'm praying that my grandfather explained the Bible one day and become a disciple of Jesus. Now, it was... A great time with the family. It was also bittersweet because it was our first time doing a family reunion, but we all missed my late father. And at the end of our reunion, my auntie said we should have a moment of silence for my late father. And it was, it was tough to, to think and reminisce. And then Right during this time, I I see my older brother start to cry. And that really got me. But then we consulted him, and we helped him, and so triumphant time at the end. But it's amazing, my my wife asked me how I was doing after that moment of silence. And I was telling her about the conversation I had with my auntie, where she asked me, how did you you deal with it when your father passed? I told her for 30 straight days, I cried in prayer. 30 straight days, I just denied myself to be devoted. And through God's grace, 
He helped me overcome doubt, discouragement, faithlessness. But I was thinking about it like, wow, those times were such fervent prayers. But you have to understand as time progresses, sometimes even when you're fruitful, the Bible says that you grow away from the tree. And I really have to prune myself back. Because just to, to be open, there's been some staleness. Where you know like you're praying, you're still praying for a good time, but you just, you don't feel like you're connecting. You know, you ever been there before? Or the classic, you know, like I've, there's been times where I'm reading and someone texts me or something and I respond to the text. That's not total devotion to God. And whenever you feel that way, it's a time to radically repent and make a decision to do something different. It baffles me. It baffles me when people say, man, I feel like I'm not connected. I feel like I'm just... And then you keep doing the same things. That's the definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting a different result. The Bible says in Proverbs 4, 18, the path of the righteous is like the morning sun, shining ever brighter and brighter to the full light of day. The Bible says the righteous get brighter and brighter. This scripture has to be what explains it to us. Now, my personal challenge for myself is to finish the Bible by my birthday. That's going to be about 14, 16 chapters a day. Now, I want to encourage you to have a challenge. What are you going to do different this summer? Is it to finish the Bible in a year? Is it to have more elongated prayer? Or more prayer fervency? Or read some soapy books. Read Dr. Mike Paris's book. Uh, it's all about campus ministry. Read cops. I mean, some of us are cops, but haven't even read cops. I want to challenge us here tonight. It's time for us to have even greater devotion to our God. Point number two. I got to speed up here. Even greater unification. Even greater unification. You know, a scripture in Genesis 11, I'm not going to turn there, where it talks about how godless people wanted to build a tower up to heaven. And God said because they were unified, nothing will be impossible for them. Yeah. What's amazing from that passage that you can read for your quiet times and your devotion, it says that godless people could do the impossible because they were unified. What can stop us from having an incredible, victorious 2023. All the people that God's brought from DFW, all the people that people that God's brought from all around the world. What can stop us is a lack of unity. And we have to play chess with Satan and keep Satan in check. Let's go to Ephesians 4. Let's look at this passage. Let's go to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 verse 1, the Bible says, I'm, we're going to go through it. It says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge thee to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Let's stop right there. I was going to keep going, but we're going to stop right there. Over here it says you have to make every effort to have unity. And it says that you have to be completely humble and gentle to keep the unity. So our virtues are good shepherds over hired hands, a prophet over a paid minister, a revolutionary over a dignitary. And he says, I urge you, a better translation could be, I beg you. Because the greatest threat to God's kingdom is you and I. A lack of unity can destroy God's kingdom. But we need to be those 
who are going to bleed for unity. Who are not going to care about our position. Who are going to care more about winning. As Jesus prayed for us in John 17, I pray, and right now he's in heaven praying for us. I pray that they be brought to complete unity. And he says after that, so that the people will know, that the world will know that I have sent them. Yeah. How are the nations going to know that we are tr the true movement of God? It's by our unity. Making a decision to be unified in a great way. You know, thinking about the basketball tournament. We're going there. There's some great basketball teams in the history of time. You got the Los Angeles Lakers. You got even the Warriors. <laughs> but one of my favorite teams was the 2008 Olympic team, the Redeem team. What was amazing about this team, this that prior to them, in the 90s, they had the dream team. Yes. And these people, Michael Jordan and Larry Bird, probably the greatest team ever assembled. Yeah, yeah. They destroyed their competition. Yeah. But then the world got better at basketball. Yeah. And they started being, beating USA. Yeah. And like, we're not letting that fly. Oh, so then they have Kobe Bryant, Dwayne Wade, LeBron James, Chris Bosh, and many more, Carmelo, Chris Paul, Darren Williams. They all come together and they call themselves the Redeem Team. Yeah. And I remember watching the final game against Spain, I was biting my nails. Because it was a close game, but they won and redeemed and got the gold medal. Yeah. But what was said about one of the role players in the Redeem Team is said about Kobe Bryant and LeBron James, which arguably these were the two best basketball players during that time. Carlos Boozer, one of the role players said, on this team, you had two alphas in the prime of their careers that don't care about who the alpha is. That was very rare. See, how did the redeem team redeem? They were totally unified. They didn't care about their position. They didn't care who scores the most points. They didn't care who led the Bible talk. They didn't care who led the study. They didn't care who was the one that was going to baptize them. All they cared about was winning the goal. And all we care about, all we care about is not winning some flimsy gold medal. All we care about is to see that golden crown one day with God in heaven. Where we can be with the angels and say glory, glory to God that we made it because of our unity. Amen. I want to challenge us. If there's any entitlements or, or weirdness that's happening, you got to just get it out. It's going to destroy the movement. It's all about doing whatever God wants you to do. In the position you're in, God has you there. In the place you're in, it was God. No one's overlooked in the kingdom. God is sovereign. Let's be totally unified, amen. My last quick point, I'm getting the tea here. Actually, why don't we get some halftime going? My last quick point. So we talked about devotion. We talked about unification. Let's talk about even greater multiplication. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Verse 1 of chapter 3 in 2 Thessalonians. Bible says, As for other matters, brothers and sisters, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you. Here Paul is addressing the church in Thessalonica, which he did plant. And he said, pray that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly rapidly, have rapid multiplication. 
so that God can be honored. What does that teach us? Multiplication honors God. When you multiply, God is glorified. And that's why we focus on giving God glory through bearing much fruit. And it's, it's simple. Matthew 9.35 says that the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. Now that scripture reads the same in the fall semester, reads the same in the spring, and reads the same in the summer. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. We blew our special missions. Now it's time to get focused on the harvest and to look at what was done in the past. But my Bible says the end of the matter will be better than the beginning. I believe 150% that the end of 2023 is going to be greater than the beginning of 2023. Here's the practical, because I got I, I to speed up here. I had more to say, but we're going we're gonna to truncate. The practical is, if we're in the fall, and then we have the same people being able to lead the studies, we can multiply, but then we're going to run dry. Because we need more disciples that could teach. If you're a new Christian, I hope you have a vision to get effective. How did Jesus do it? He multiplied himself into other men. And those men, when they thought they killed Jesus, they realized there were 120 more of them. And those 120 sold out devoted disciples, went on to evangelize the nations in one generation. And I, I, want, I want to inspire us here tonight. We're in the beginning right now. Getting to a thousand for the Lord, we have to understand God is greater than that. Come on. Come on. It's not just about getting a thousand, it's about getting to tens of thousands. Because yeah. yeah. when you multiply, God is glorified. Yeah. I remember this past couple weeks, our shepherd who's now in Dallas, Paul Hammond, oh. he, he sent me a screenshot of the Southland region known as the South Central region back in the 90s in the former movement. And he showed it to me that they had 1,303 disciples in one region. I was like, that's awesome. And that's what we want to see. I believe the vision for every region right now is to be fruitful, every week and I think some of the regions we gotta be even thinking even greater things but can you imagine the day which I believe will one day come every region daily baptisms I believe it will happen through your faith because we're going to see even greater multiplication. <laughs> to close out, let's go to Revelation 14. So funny, you say Revelation, everyone goes, ooh and ah. Revelation 14. In verse 13. The Bible says in verse 13, or Revelation 14 says, Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit. They will rest from their labor. For their deeds will follow them. What's amazing about this passage, it says that when we go up to see God one day, our deeds will follow us. 
And I believe that when God sees the deeds of the City of Angel International Christian Church and all the disciples yeah. all around the world, right. you'll see that we all made a decision right. to be vessels of God. Yeah. That we all made a decision to say, yes, I have true faith. That we made a decision to do even greater things than God. And I believe that if we have even greater devotion, we will see even greater unification. And then we'll see even greater multiplication. And to God be the glory.